Here you go. Hello, everyone. Welcome to today's live broadcast, You Want Me to Culture What? Challenging Requests for Culture in the Clinical Microbiology Lab. I'm Christina Jewell of Lab Roots, and I'll be your moderator for today's event. Today's educational web seminar is presented and sponsored by Lab Roots, the leading scientific social networking website and provider of virtual events and webinars advancing scientific collaboration and learning. Before we start, there are a few instructions. We want to hear from you during this interactive broadcast, so please ask questions and leave us a comment. Answers are welcome too. You can do this by hitting the green Q&A button at the lower left of the presentation window and typing in your comments and questions. We'll try to get to as many as we can and we'll follow up if we don't have time today. Want a better look? You can enlarge the slide window by clicking on the screen icon in the lower right hand corner of the slide window. If you can't hear or see this presentation properly, let us know by clicking on the support button on the top right or use the Q&A button. We'll make sure we try to resolve any issues as quickly as possible. This is an educational webinar and thus offers free continuing education credits. After the webinar is over, please click on the CE button located at the bottom left hand corner of your webpage and follow the process of obtaining your credits. Now let's get right to today's presenter. We are proud to welcome Dr. Amy Lieber. Dr. Lieber received her PhD from the Ohio State University and did a postdoctoral fellowship in clinical and public health microbiology at UCLA Medical Center. She is a diplomate of the American Board of Microbiology and active in the American Society for Microbiology, ASCT, and AMP. She is currently the Director of Clinical Microbi Microbiology and Immunoserology at Nationwide Children's Hospital in Columbus, Ohio, and an Associate Professor of Pathology and Pediatrics at The Ohio State University. She is Editor-in-Chief of the Clinical Microbiology Procedures Handbook. Her research interests include new molecular diagnostics and diagnosis of infectious diseases in pediatric populations. I will now turn the presentation over to Dr. Amy Lieber. Dr. Lieber? Thank you, Christina. Thank you, Christine. And I'd like to welcome all of you to this uh, conference today and, and thank Lab Roots for this opportunity. So we will begin with my first slide. So as the title implies, we're going to talk today about the unusual requests we see in microbiology. And I'm going to assume a good majority of you are clinical microbiologists or laboratorians. So you really relate to kind of those dilemmas that come up about what you should do with an unusual request. And for those of you that aren't clinical laboratorians, you'll have a peek into the world of a clinical micro. So here's the outline of what we'll discuss, a little background. Then we'll discuss the culture of objects related to acute and chronic injuries. We'll discuss a little about the environment of the hospital and pharmacy and what cultures might occur there and medical legal cases. And we'll do this on a case-based methodology. And there'll be two times when I'm gonna ask you a question and I hope you'll answer. And then finally, a little bit about policies in the clinical micro lab. So here, here's a little uh, guy out on the limb, and it says, sticks and stones may break my bones, but you ain't gonna get me to culture it. And that really kind of lies in the fact that um, for several reasons, sticks are often the objects of injury, particularly with children. Um, so it relates in that way. And the little guy's out on the limb, and so that relates to kind of how your technologists might feel if they get a request for this, something they've never heard of or done before. They kind of feel like they're going out on a limb. And then in micro, there's lumpers and splitters. Well, in this situation, there are people that will absolutely not do cultures and some that might. So today I'm gonna to kind of convince you what I think is right. Um, that may not be absolutely correct, but so, some situation where you should culture and then some where you shouldn't. 
So what are we actually talking about when we're culturing objects? These are requests to test samples other than of human origin. So what we do in clinical micro every day is test different tissues and body fluids to detect organisms or diagnose infection. But here we're talking about something that's not actually from a human. They're peri or pseudoclinical. So they may or may not be directly related to an individual patient. And so for that reason, they really fall outside of the generally accepted practice of what we call clinical microbiology. So here's some examples. So let's, we'll talk about foreign bodies, either through an acute injury or retained. Um, sometimes you'll get asked to culture a fluid or foods. For example, we used to culture the food for the bone marrow transplant patients. This was a long time ago. We don't do that anymore. Or you might get a request to culture a fluid that's associated with a ventilator, a ventilator and they're not really sure what it is. Uh, many of you might do environmental cultures in a hospital setting, particularly to look at, for example, Legionella in the water supply, or possibly uh, terminal cleaning in rooms where they want to assure they've uh, re uh, removed all the C. difficile uh, spores from the room, or that one thing you might never have thought of. So as you're sitting here today, if you have some examples, type them in and share them. So here's what I am not. I'm not an environmental microbiologist, water or industrial microbiologist, nor am I a food or veterinary microbiologist or a member of CSI. And the reason I say that is in a hospital setting, the physician often thinks microbiology is just a single discipline. So why wouldn't I know how to um, culture that, you know, water from a dental tap. But really, we all know that these are each separate disciplines. So that's sometimes the discomfort we have in that we're asked to go outside of our field of practice. So I always like to remind them that I am a clinical microbiologist. And that really is associated with infections. But occasionally, we go outside of that realm. So in terms of evidence, You've all heard of evidence-based medicine now, where we have to have data to support what we're doing. Well, in this instance, there really is not a lot of literature or actual guidelines about what to do when we culture objects. So really, it's based on case reports or personal experience, or what I like to call tribal knowledge. So I trained at UCLA, so therefore, whatever the people did at UCLA is probably what I'm gonna end up doing with these unusual requests. And then you see at the bottom there, it says the plural of antidote is not data. And so by that, I'm just saying that I'm going to give you examples, but there is no absolute truth. So you may really argue with me or disagree, but these are kind of my philosophies. So let's start with a case. So this is a case of an acute injury. And by that, I mean there's an insult to the body through some kind of object or uh, device and it's removed rather immediately. So here we have an image of a brain. This is a four-year-old child, and you probably can tell that there is a pencil sticking out of his eye. So he fell while he was carrying a pencil, and the pencil went through his orbit, the, the uh, area right around his eye. It penetrated his sinuses and went into his frontal lobes. Uh, he was transported to our hospital within a number of hours, but they obviously, the EMS didn't want to remove that pencil because it's impeding on, uh, you know, critical structures, so to say. So he went to surgery and they removed the pencil and they sent it to the lab. So here's my poll question. Would you culture this object? So yes, no, or it depends. So you should see a little box on your screen that you can answer this, and we will get the answer in just a moment. So with all of these decisions, and one of the founding tenets of medicine is first do no harm, meaning it's sometimes better to do nothing uh, because doing something may lead to more harm than good. So in all these situations, it's good to take a step back and say, what is the clinical meaning of the result? For example, if we do culture the pencil, what will be the impact on patient care? 
And we always like to ask the clinician, if I give you a result, what will you do with it? And you'd think that's a simple question, but often it's kind of a knee-jerk reaction and they're just ordering it. Um, who is requesting the culture? At our hospital, we have a very close relationship with ID physicians. So if they ask me to do something unusual, I'll usually do it because I think they kind of are on the right track and we often are thinking alike. Next, if you don't do it, who will? So sometimes if they're desperate to get something cultured, they might send it out. And then you have to worry about the reliability of this reference lab, or it may take a long time to get results. Um, and it will not therefore be useful for patient care. And as with all of these issues, we want to be cognizant of the liability that may be incurred if we do this culture and it's used to treat the patients. So this is a quote I like to use. Remember, ordering a diagnostic test is like picking your nose in public. You must first consider what you will do if you find something. And that goes back and relates to the question I said. If you ask the physician, what are you going to do with this result? And if they really don't have a good answer, then probably it's not a good idea to do the culture. Because again, it's not a human sample, and so it's very hard sometimes to interpret what those results might mean. So you might use this the next time you get an unusual request. And we have to think about regulations. So for clinical laboratories in the United States, they're overseen by CMS, the Centers for Medicaid and Medicare Services. And the laws that CMS uses are CLIA, the Clinical Laboratory Improvement Amendments, which really regulate testing on human samples. So in our situation, a pencil isn't a human sample, so it's a non-clinical sample. And also of note, it doesn't apply to anyone that's deceased. So autopsy samples, for example, don't fall under these regulations. Similarly, there may be other guidances. For example, if you're going to do pharmacy testing in your hospital, those are governed by different guidances or rules. Um, the FDA, for example, uh, oversees drug sterility and things. So that's an area they might oversee. Also, for example, donor testing for transplants is overseen by FDA regulation. And also there's public health laws concerning infectious diseases. You might get into situations where law enforcement is involved. For example, abuse cases um, in our hospital, if there's a culture result uh, related to that, then it would be involved in law enforcement. And possibly other things I haven't even thought about. So again, we have to be cognizant that if we're culturing objects, it's kind of in a gray area of what regulations apply to that. And this is a view of a surgeon. So if I have a surgeon removing a pencil from my child's eye, if he says send it to the lab, he's not going to take the time to think, what are the proper cultures to order, or should I order that? So really, at our institution, we'd rather it get sent to the lab then we have the ability to decide if it's appropriate or not. And I have beware of mixed messages because often um, we get mad at surgeons. For example, they'll remove a 10 pound piece of tissue and what do we get? We get the swab they stuck in the tissue. So we don't want to kind of poo poo them sending us stuff. And really ultimately it would be great to have a discussion prior to them sending it. Um, in a policy that's vetted by all parties involved. So the worst thing that happens, and, and we'll have an example in a moment, is it's the weekend and some unusual request comes and the poor technologist has no idea what to do um, with those requests. So here is the pathology report. So it went to PATH and they did a gross of the pencil. And here you see a beautiful description of a number two pencil with uh, yellow wooden lead, but of note is the pointed end of the was bloody, but the lead is broken off at the level of the wood. So it was important for them to send a path out the pencil to pathology in that we noted that there may be something retained in the brain because the end of the wood wasn't there. The other thing that's not noted in this report is in this case, the parents were actually concerned that a dog had chewed on the pencil. So now we have dog bacteria uh, possibly 
in, uh, in, the, in that wound also. Of note also, they said there was no soft tissue noted on it. So all in all, I think it was well worth them sending the pencil to pathology. And here's some notes from a clinician. This is an ID physician who followed up on this case. So in bullet one, he's talking about what empiric therapy they started um, this child on, and it's a broad range covering a number of bacterial organisms. Um, they also cultured for MRSA, because remember the pencil went through the sinuses, so if the person is colonized with MRSA, we'd wanna be concerned for covering that. And here in blue you see he also asked them to send it to micro for aerobic culture. And he notes this will only be useful in management if an organism grows that resistant to the antibiotic regimen he um, picked to begin with. So we actually did culture the pencil. Now some of you are saying that was silly, you shouldn't have done it, or some of you say, yeah, I would do it. But how do you culture a pencil? Well, actually, we know it wasn't sterile to begin with because the EMS, probably the parents, the surgeons, there was a lot of handling, at least of the exposed part of the pencil, but we put it in a sterile bag and added a culture broth, and then we plated the broth and incubated the remainder of that fluid. And again, he only ordered routine bacterial culture. So if you note, here's a screenshot from our computer system. It's important to try to label this in a way to know later that it's not actually a human uh, specimen. So here we have a sample sent from surgery, possible contamination sample is a pencil removed at surgery. And it grew quite a number of organisms. It grew two enteric gram-negative rods, E. cloacae and Klebsiella oxytoca. It also grew enterococcus and bacillus species, not anthracis. So if we think about his coverage, we had done susceptibilities, and indeed, this child was covered empirically with the drugs he chose. And if you work at a children's hospital, or even probably in an adult hospital, we see a lot of injuries related to objects. So things like pencils or scissors, um, lollipops. Don't let your children run with lollipops or popsicles. Um, anything you could imagine almost, uh, we have seen come through the ED. Now they don't always send them for culture, uh, but if you look at the literature related to this, there is some literature, uh, basically case reports. So here's an example of a rather shocking image. This is a young lady who was at a um, wedding reception and she was dancing and she was bumped from behind and fell on a chopstick. So it was, she was impaled on this chopstick. Um, and here you can see it broke off at the back of her skull. Um, actually, this patient ended up doing rather well. They removed the chopstick. Um, they didn't send it for culture, but you can understand that this went straight through her mouth. So what are the bacteria we would be worried about? It's your normal oral flora. So acute injuries in general are not that dramatic. They're usually something like you step on a, a, a thorn and it's impaled in your foot. So generally, it's really not useful to culture the insulting object because when you remove it minutes or an hour or so after you get the injury, it's really not an infection at that time. So really that result of culturing doesn't necessarily predict what's gonna actually take seed and cause infection. So the general rule is we cover these prophylactically, again, based on the type of injury and the flora um, associated with it. Now in this case, we considered culturing it because it was involving a critical structure, the brain. So if it is involved in a critical structure or you'll have limited ability to actually obtain any additional cultures, they're not gonna go stick a swab deep into that child's brain necessarily. So we decided that because we knew the clinician and he had given us somewhat of a thoughtful response that we would go ahead and culture that pencil. So what are the results of our poll? If you can push the survey to see how many of you answered this. And I don't see the results. Ah, 
Ah, it's almost evenly split. Yes, no, and it depends. And really, those are all right answers. So now let's move on. And talk about chronic injuries. Here is where you have an insulting object, but maybe it's stuck. So here's a little eight-year-old girl who was wearing flip-flops, and she stepped on a thorn. And her mom took her right in and removed the thorn and washed the wound. And it really wasn't getting any better. So they took her to the pediatrician and she had a course of augmentin, an antibiotic, and really still continued to have problems. And you could kind of appreciate the swelling um, at the base of this toe here. And so they finally decided to go to her pediatrician again to get some imaging. So they did an x-ray of the foot and really saw no broken bones, only swelling. A couple days later, still no resolution, so they did a more sophisticated bone scan. Again, saw swelling and then possible bone infection or osteomyelitis in that end of that toe. So eventually, this is now about two months later, she's referred to ID clinic for management of possible osteo. And so ID ordered one more imaging study. So if you can guess what that is, while well, I change the slide, it's ultrasound. So really they use ultrasound and here you see it covered in a sheath where they're using it to image into the tissues to find the object and remove it with an instrument. And here you can see an image of the forceps going in to grab this thorn. And it was a th three millimeter thorn body that they found at the base of her toe. So it had been there for a number of months. Here it is retrieved, you can see. It's, it looks kind of small, but really that would be extremely irritating. And again, it poked into her bone and caused a bone infection. And it, it grew bacillus species and coagulase negative staph. So in these cases, we feel it is worthwhile to culture the object because it's been inside the tissues for a long time. Here's another case, and again, these are pediatric cases um, because I work at a pediatric institution uh, and children are prone to these. But this is a young child, she, I think she's about 13 months. She was running and fell on a sewer grate. And they took her to the hospital, washed out the wound, didn't see any foreign body, stitched it up. Then you can see she continued to have orbital swelling. And there was really a concern that there was something um, either in the eye or an infection. So they took her back to surgery. Um, they drained it, washed it out, still couldn't find a, the foreign body, and finally had to have interventional radiology come in to find this object. And again, they used ultrasound, and they found this 11 millimeter piece of wood in the eye muscle. The, the interesting thing about ultrasound is Wood will not show up in an x-ray, right? Because it's not radiolucent. And so ultrasound really is very useful to find these um, retained foreign bodies. And in this case, the culture of the wood group, E. coli and Pantoia, and the culture of the, the wound itself only grew E. coli. So you could say we had some added benefit of culturing that piece of wood. So in general, for retained foreign bodies, I would say, obviously, you're going to culture and gram stain of the wound. And if you choose to culture the foreign body, which I think is useful, um, in, it depends on what it is. Um, if it's large enough, you might want to do roll it on a solid media or put it in a thio broth. And then you might make some considerations based on what type of object it is. Like if it's water related and you're near in the south, you might add a vibrio plate. Or if it's wood, a natural wood from the outdoors, you might consider adding a fungal culture. So all those things come into play when you're considering how to culture these. And in general, the organisms are those that cause skin infections like staph and malic strep, a variety of gram-negative rods. We'll talk about pseudomonas in a moment. It's very well associated with foot wounds where you have a puncture wound through the bottom of your foot. And then a obviously tetanus if you think you've been exposed to the soil. So let's take a little detour. This is a very interesting area when you 
when I went to make up this talk, all different kinds of anecdotal reports. But here's a little bit about shoe microbiology. So it was long known that there's an association with pseudomonas and injuries related to puncture wounds through shoes, but no one knew where the pseudomonas came from. So this is a study of 100 patients. Um, these were patients in the waiting room of a pediatrician where they cultured the heel of the foot and then the inside of the shoe underneath the heel, just the surface of the shoe. And they found a lot of normal flora of the foot, but if you go down here, there was very little uh, Pseudomonas aeruginosa, only one of these out of 100. So they concluded that really um, the shoe wasn't really involved in this, meaning the Pseudomonas either came from the foot or some other part of the environment. But then a little later, some clever person, uh, Peter Gilligan's group, actually did something very interesting. They had three groups. Group one was people with known uh, bone infections due to pseudomonas. They got their shoes, group one, and nearly 91% of them, they found pseudomonas in the shoes. Um, group two is a control group of uh, used shoes by adolescents. Um, that must have been fun to culture those because if you have teenagers, you know how uh, smelly their tennis shoes can get. But they saw some pseudomonas, obviously not as much, and they got a whole bunch of new and unused shoes and found none. And the difference between this and the previous study is they took the foam lining, that squishy, moist foam lining out of the shoe and cultured that. And that is indeed where the Pseudomonas lives. It's almost like a little culture plate for a bacteria. So you can understand that if you have a puncture wound going up through that, through the foam, it's going to deposit those bacteria in your tissue. And this is a uh, slide, a table I put together of objects and associated infections. So really it has to do with the object and the organisms. So for example, we talked about thorns. The classic example is Pantoia associated with them, but also things like Sporothrix or Rose Handler's disease. We talked about wood. Again, it's what if the toothpick goes through your uh, mouth, you're going to worry about mouth flora. Or if you have something penetrate the gut, it would be gut flora. We talked about Pseudomonas and other non-fermenters and non-tuberculous mycobacteria from foot wounds. Uh, pitchforks, you may not be in an area where you have a lot of pitchfork injuries, but in Ohio we have a lot of Amish and the children often are out in the fields working very early. And so we do have uh, injuries related to that where we worry about tetanus because this population is often unvaccinated. We see fish hooks and non-fermenters and vibrio. Um, mi missiles, now in the literature missiles means bullets or BBs, so that can be various um, associated organisms. But the interesting thing is bullets are often at such high velocity that they're so hot, they're really more or less sterile when they enter the tissue. And that's why sometimes they think it's more harm to try to remove a bullet fragment than leaving it in place because they don't expect it to be an infection. And then inserted objects. Um, at a children's hospital, again, you'd be surprised what you find that a kid can stick in any opening of their body. Um, usually they don't result in a lot of injury. It's in your nose or your, your bum that they stick it and we can get it out rather easily. Um, bites we see a lot of too and we worry about both human flora and then for example for dog flora we worry about pastorella. So that's kind of a little table of that. So that's kind of the objects related injuries and um, I'd be interested to know what side you come out on on those objects but let's move on to the environment in the hospital. So often the clinical microbiology lab is kind of the resource for other aspects of monitoring the health and safety of patients in the hospital. We talked about water testing. Um, many hospitals do monitoring for Legionella in-house or send it out. We, for example, monitor the water for our um, dental patients and our dialysis waters. You may be asked to do sterility testing for autoclaves or some, some types of drugs or compounding drugs. Um, pharmacy is another example. 
this is a whole different area. We'll talk a little bit about pharmacy testing, but you need to do your homework before you start that. And finally, air sampling. That can be done in multiple areas of the hospital. Um, at Children's, we monitor our bone marrow transplant units um, with some regularity to assure the quality of the air for those patients. So let's talk a little bit about pharmacy. The idea is that within a pharmacy, they're gonna have practices and controls to help maintain a suitable aseptic environment for drugs that they're compounding. So they're making up chemotherapeutics to hang for the um, transplant patients or other areas. So they have various approaches in that compounding pharmacy environment to try to assess sterility. Things like total plate counts, uh, finger touch plates, surface viable organisms, and air viable organisms. And this, again, is a whole discipline governed by um, rules or, or really guidelines. This is similar to CLSI. There's an organization called USP, United States Pharmacopeia. And they have a huge book. And within that book are chapters related to how to monitor the environment in a compounding pharmacy. Um, so any of you that are doing that are probably moaning and groaning. Um, it takes a lot of effort, but it's very expensive to do this out of, outside of the hospital. So there's often an incentive to do this in-house. And if we think about it, drugs are made in two ways. The manufacturer of drugs, the whole plant at Eli Lilly or Pfizer, is built with the design of the primary process there is making drugs as opposed to compounding pharmacies. Here, we're often doing this within the hospital, within a small area of the hospital that's the pharmacy. So we're trying to back engineer for these processes. So it can be sometimes difficult to maintain uh, sterility in these environments. So this is an example of glove fingertip sampling. So here, when you're making up these sterile compounds, you have to gown and glove. And we want to make sure that those people that are doing that aren't contaminating the product because really it is the humans involved in the process that are the greatest risk. So this type of training is done to assess their ability to maintain sterility. So they gown and glove, and then they touch all of their fingers to the surface of this auger media, which is then incubated. Um, and they've done periodically. And interestingly, there are people that are actually totally follow procedure, but they're considered shedders in that for some reason, they really shed much more organism than most people and really then can't be considered for actually doing this type of work, not through any fault of their own, it's just their biology. And then here is a picture of a surface sampling device. It has auger on both sides. You lay that contact plate on the surface and then incubate it. It's designed to make sure the cleaning processes are adequate uh, so that drugs can be made in these environments. And finally, air sampling. As I said, we do this in the pharmacy, but also in other areas of the hospital. And there's two methods to this. Gravitometric, where you literally just set a plate out and let the air settle onto the plate, or you actively sample the air through volumetric sampling. So here we have a picture of four different devices used for air sampling. And again, it, it draws through it a large volume of air, and on the bottom are plates that are impacted by that air and are collecting spores and bacteria. So here's an example of a gravitometric plate. You can see a few colonies of um, mold here and some bacteria. But on the other side, we can see many more colonies of mold uh, that shows the increased sensitivity of this technique for, uh, as opposed to just letting the air passively settle onto the plate. So we're going to use always volumetric air sampling, uh, possibly in addition to gravitometric, but certainly this volumetric is the better method. And here's just an example of a, a control chart that's used in the chemo buffering area. That's the area in the pharmacy where they 
for actually making up the chemotherapeutic agents in that compounding pharmacy. So they periodically every month are monitoring and there is an action limit that line in red and when the colony counts go above that limit, that's when we need to do remediation. They're going to look at their processes, do some uh, terminal cleaning and retraining. Again, all to prevent contamination of these drugs used in patients. Now, we've talked about what is a compounding pharmacy, and this might spark in your memory a really tragic event that occurred related to the New England Compounding Center. So this was a, farm, a compounding pharmacy that was making up sterile preparations of methylprednisolone. Um, and these drugs were injected directly into people's spine or joints to relieve pain. And what happened is they were making up large batches and they sent them and eventually there were over 700, actually 751 cases of fungal infections related to these steroid injections in 20 states with 64 deaths. And here you see the map on the right. The primary fungus was Exerohylum rostratum that they isolated. Here we up in the upper right hand corner, it's a dematiaceous mold. It's common in the environment. And here's an example of one pain center in Michigan where they faxed an order for 400 vials. They gave it to 625 patients, 217 were infected and 15 died. So the sterility of that environment and following practices is very important. And indeed on inspection, this pharmacy was not following proper policies and procedures. Number one, they were making up large batches for distribution, not just filling a prescription for a given patient. And eventually there were over 15 arrests uh, related to this um, and all the deaths involved. So it's very important if you're going to do sterility testing in the pharmacy that you get your um, really understand what is um, involved. All right, so I said we do monitoring of air cultures in our patient units. And here's a story related to our own facility. So we monitor our bone marrow transplant units quarterly. And the results are then monitored by infection control. Um, there is guidance related to bone marrow transplant units and saying that you need to assess the quality of the air along with the other things. And we do that. And our sampling in May was actually unusual in that all 21 of our samplings were positive for some level of mold. Now I will tell you that in the summer months, these colony counts go up a little bit, but never all of them. And the other thing to remember is that the amount of mold detected in these units, even when it is detected, is orders of magnitude lower than in your own home. There are millions of mold spores in your own home. But in this case, we were predominantly seeing penicillium species in Cladosporium. So there was a great deal of concern and we did some investigating. And part of that investigation involved going up to the air handling units on the top of the building associated with the BMT unit. Here you can see the baffles. These are the air handling things between the HEPA filterings. And you can see some little spots on it. And if we look a little closer, we can see a lot of little spots. And actually we did culture this and it grew mold. Now this isn't to say this level of mold was getting into the BMT uh, because there were HEPA filters between, but certainly we see the penicillium, that lighter green, and the darker mold is the cladosporium. Here's both just, uh, we tried to quantitate this, but certainly there's a lot of mold there. So what happened then is they removed all of those air handling units and bleached them, uh, replaced them, replaced all the filters. And now we've instituted a, a more um, regular inspection of these units. But often this probably goes uh, unthought of in terms of monitoring. The other thing we found out is um, our hospital is located in an urban environment and on various times and particularly at New Year's there are gunshots in the area and so what we discovered is there was a leak around a window that allowed moisture to impinge into the drywall and it too was growing penicillium 
and it was actually related to a bullet hole in the ceiling, the roof actually. And there are many, probably most hospitals in urban environments, you could find bullet holes in the ceiling. I learned that. And the other issue is you shoot it up at a high velocity, and then on the way back down, these bullets gain velocity. So they can penetrate through, you know, hard surfaces. So we've instituted a more regular bullet hole surveillance on the roof. So let's finish with some, yeah, I'm doing good on time, some medical legal issues related to a request for culturing. So here's a scenario. We have a nurse who notices a cloudy substance in an unopened single-use vial of heparin. Now, heparin is a manufactured drug. It's not compounded, right? So it comes straight from the pharmaceutical company. She doesn't use the vial, and she calls the pharmacy. Pharmacy checks the other vials with the same lot number, and there are also some other vials that look yellowish and cloudy. So they call the lab and ask if you would analyze this material. So I'll pause a moment just to ask you, would you culture this object? I'm just going to give you the answer because this is clearly no. This really involves regulation by the FDA. This isn't something a clinical lab should necessarily get involved with. Um, and there is a mechanism to report this through MedWatch. And here's like a screenshot of the MedWatch site. And it says that product problems should be reported. Things with quality, authenticity, performance, or safety should be reported. And really it's important to report these in real time so that if the FDA gets more than one warning or can call about a product, they can issue a recall or guidance more quickly. So these are situations where we would not get involved in culturing it. It's an unopened vial of a manufactured drug. But the next scenario actually happened, and it again is a medical legal case. So this happened on second shift on the weekend, and so everything in, in micro and in the lab in general happens on Friday afternoon or on the weekend. So they got a call and requesting a stat gram stain on a culture of an IV fluid. So the technologist is like, well, okay, if you send it, I'll do it. So they sent it, but it didn't have any orders associated with it. So she called back up and said, there's no orders. And they just said, no, we don't want to order it. Please just do the gram stain. So she did, and she reported out few yeast and no cell seen. She said, I'm not going to do the culture. I don't know how to culture this. So she held it in the refrigerator. So on Monday morning, they called me, please culture this fluid. Well, the situation was this. This is an IV bag with, um, that was going into a 17-year-old patient's veins. Um, this is a patient with complex medical history who had undergone a um, gastrectomy and had an ostomy bag hanging along with some other medical conditions. So the nurse went by the room and the IV was alarming and she went in and saw this cloudy fluid. So you can kind of appreciate there's a cloudiness to it. And also here is the filter before it goes into the arm. And again, you can see particulate matter. The mom was in the room and she was acting very nervous and, and then was trying to dump the IV bag down the drain. So there was great amount of concern and here we're getting into a medical legal issue because there was concern about how did that material get into this IV bag. So here's a situation where they asked me to culture this. So again, I'm going to ask to poll you, would you culture this fluid? So hopefully our little poll will pop up. So while you're answering that, I will tell you what we did. We actually did culture the IV fluid. The ID being, we wanted to know what, if anything, bacterially was going into this patient because it really was affecting this individual patient, even if it was a medical legal issue. So we actually spun down 25 mils of this fluid and plated the sediment. And here's what it grew. Again, we tried to identify it as not necessarily a human sample, 
it was an IV fluid, and it grew many Candida albicans and few Enterococcus fecium, which was v vancomycin resistant. You might think, well, hmm, where did that come from? Well, it, it turns out that the patient had been on many, many antibiotics because obviously they were um, undergoing surgery for the gut. So he had very reduced normal flora. And so this was actually a case of the mother withdrawing fluid from a syringe from the ostomy and putting it in the IV fluid line. And this was his actual stool flora. He, he grew a candida albicans from the blood also. So in this case, we felt it was very useful to help treat this patient to culture this fluid. I learned a lot during this incident. I talked to lawyers, I talked to the police. Um, they did remove this material and send it to a forensic lab. But the idea is that a forensic lab is not designed to be a clinical lab. So the turnaround time is much longer. And in fact, it took, I, I never even received the results of forensic studies. So in this discussion with this actual incident, again, I talked to one of our attorneys and for them, the overriding principle is again, will it benefit the patient? All the way back to the beginning, that risk benefit ratio. And in this case, the answer was yes. So she said, go ahead and do this. Um, the forensic results are not uh, clinical results due to turnaround time. In this case, there really wasn't a chain of custody so we have that process under review, but still we want to handle this um, as we would a patient sample in that it got, we eventually gave it an accession number um, and those types of things. And you really do need to consider carefully whether this gets put in the patient record. Um, in this case, it altered treatment, it helped guide therapy. So we did put it in the chart. But what I learned also is that if there's, um, consideration that the, the Munchausen by proxy is what this is called. And in those cases, sometimes if there's, the parent thinks there's a suspicion or something, they, it might accelerate harm. So you really do need to be careful in these instances. So just my opinion on ask to culture uh, kind of fluids or objects, uh, fluids and syringes not directly associated with patient care, I would use caution. Unopened drugs, we talked about, don't do that. Um, sterility of materials used in treatment, so things that come out of the compounding pharmacy, I'd be very cautious if you ask in the lab to assess that. And then anything that does not have immediate or significant positive impact on the patient, I would use caution. And then with all things in the clinical lab, we have to find a way to communicate the results. And again, you might put it in the LIS, but you want to make sure it's clear it's not a human sample. There may be occasions where you do, you think it's better to do it verbally or by email, but whatever way you do it, you want to keep thorough documentation and issue proper disclaimers. Uh, and then in terms of billing, it's difficult to understand because it doesn't really fall under uh, CLIA, but you want to consider would Medicare or Medicaid deem this acceptable and pay because otherwise the patient may be stuck with the bill. So sometimes we'll absorb the cost of these types of things in the laboratory. And we talked about risk, that risk benefit ratio, it could contribute to an adverse outcome because we're exposing the hospital to liability. And again, we could set a precedent for bad habits. Um, I'm guilty of this. I'll, I'll give in to a request, not necessarily in this arena, to a physician, and then they come back and want it often. And even if the physician or the surgeon says, I, I, I'm asking you to do this, I'll take responsibility. Really, you, the director, more or less, we, it still has accountability. Now, there are no there's no way to write a policy for these unusual culture requests, um, but we do have a policy and really it says consult the director is one of the first caveats. And to hold all of these items in the refrigerator. So for the most part, we're trying to maintain the level of organism. We don't want overgrowth to occur. So we put it in the refrigerator. Um, 
Um, and if you have some type of rudimentary policy, it's, it's a starting point for discussion. And the people you really need at the, the table are people from surgery, infection control, epidemiology, and other clinical groups that are sending you these kind of unusual requests. The bottom line is you want to give the technologist who's there on the weekend in the middle of the night something to go by to help them understand what to do. So let's see the results of our poll of would you have cultured that fluid? Drum roll, please. Yes, I agree, because it had impact on the patient. So 65% of you said yes, and that I would agree with. All right, so we'll close out with this final question. This is um, Seinfeld and this is Kramer, and they were watching a surgery for Elaine's boyfriend, and somehow Kramer decided to bring junior mints into the operating theater, and one of them gets loose and ends up in the middle of the, the sterile field. So would you culture that object? That seems like a funny question, but actually I've heard stories of um, requests to culture flies that were found in the surgical suite that landed inside the patient. So it's not that far out of the realm of possibility. So in summary, we talked about the, the request to culture unusual objects should be considered in the context of the risk-benefit ratio for the patient. I think you need to recognize the ability of your laboratory and what instances where it wouldn't be appropriate, either because it might lead to um, bad outcomes or it's something you're not familiar with whatsoever. And those instances where you should go ahead and try to help and do the culturing. Uh, environmental culturing is possible, but you need to do your homework, particularly as it relates to pharmacy. And these unusual requests should be reviewed by multiple parties and agreement reached, hopefully beforehand. So if you can have some kind of policy that has a general outline of considerations, it's very helpful. And finally, don't run with pencils. So with that, I will close out my presentation. And if you can help me with the questions or comments, thank you. Excellent presentation, Dr. Lieber. Thank you for bringing that information to us. Before we get started with all of your questions, here's a quick reminder about how to reach us today. Questions can be sent via the green Q&A button at the lower left of the presentation window. We'll get to as many as we can. First question, do you accept animal specimens in your laboratory and how do you handle them? That's an interesting question. Actually, um, we do get requests to culture animal specimens. Um, we have some research associated with our institution. And for example, we'll often get uh, diarrheal stools on primates uh, because primates actually get diarrhea due to their nerves if they get upset. But then they're trying to distinguish that from um, infectious agents. So we will culture uh, stool. Other requests are a little more tricky because the normal flora and pathogens of animals can be very specific to that animal. So you can get too far out on that limb. Um, the other issue I'll bring up is for certain primates, like I think it's macaques, um, they carry a herpes virus, herpes B, that is actually deadly for humans. So I would issue caution for those of you in chemistry or hematology if you're asked to do testing on uh, primate blood to really think twice about that. Next question. What can we, on the clinical MD side of things, do to help our micro lab in the instance when we have an object we'd like to have cultured? Well, first of all, dialogue. 
to and to recognize that you you're asking them something outside of their normal purview and to really have a, a justification for why you would want that done um, I think there are instances where it, it really also depends on the temperament of the people in your micro lab I think there's some that you could never convince but I think there is justification. It's the only thing is there's not a lot of literature to support it. But if you have a good explanation of why you wanted to do this and what will be the consequence in or changes in therapy, that would be number one. And to do this ahead of time, um, to call ahead, so to speak, to try to get an agreement. So it's not just showing up on their doorstep. Next question. Even in the case of the pencil of the pencil you described, the doctor still does not know what or if there is an infection. So is it really worthwhile? Therein lies the argument against it. And um, I think that in this case, uh, we did uncover bacteria but all of them were actually covered with the empiric therapy. So you could argue it really didn't add anything. Um, I just feel that if it, in such a serious situation where there were circumstances, uh, for example, that the dog had chewed on the pencil, so possibly there was pasturella in the wound. Um, I think in those situations where there's a, a, a kind of a critical structure involved, I would argue that it is useful. Now, it may not be useful to culture a, a nail that comes out of a foot because, number one, a nail isn't necessarily very porous, so it may not hold a lot of organisms in, in, in the object, um, and if it's removed quickly. So somewhere in between, I think, is the answer. Um, but from my perspective, we, we made the right choice in culturing the pencil. That is all the time we have for today. I would like to once again thank Dr. Amy Lieber for her presentation. Dr. Lieber, do you have any final comments for us? Just to thank all of you today and um, please again, don't run with pencils. Thank you again, Dr. Amy Lever, for this great presentation. And thank you again to our sponsor, LabRoots, for making it possible to bring this presentation to you. Today's webcast will be available for on-demand viewing through December 7, 2016. You will receive an email from us alerting you when it's available on demand and post it on labroots.com. You are welcome to forward this announcement to any colleagues who weren't able to join in today. Thank you for logging on and participating in today's broadcast. See you next time.